Great. So it would be it would be great to get a little bit of the background aside from what we've sort of read on Wikipedia. Uh, I do a little bit know. I do know that you know you you came from a musical family, and uh, you know I, I'm guessing music was uh, some sort of natural progression. But then you also went went to UCLA and graduated in applied applied sciences and mathematics. So it would be great to 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 hear the story behind all of this. Sure. Well, it kind of makes sense because my mom was the musician of the family. She was a piano major from USC, and she started me and my sister playing the piano very young. Mm -hmm. And uh, my my father was a astrophysicist who worked for uh, the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, which is a division of NASA in the 70s, where he worked on a lot of the unmanned space flights. So I had the engineer father and the musician mother and they both certainly rubbed off on me. And I think uh, I was always, you know, into my music and was passionate about music. But I was also pragmatic enough to realize that there may not be a, a career at the end of the tunnel. So I, uh, in school, I was very focused on kind of the math and the sciences. And, and the deal was with my parents was they'd continue to support my music as long as I had a backup plan. And that was going to college and getting a degree uh, where I could, you know, get a real job one day. And uh, I enjoyed math and the sciences, and that's kind of why I ended up as a math major at UCLA. I see. And and how did you get, was it was it easier to get your first break because your mom was a musician? How, what, what, what was the process? And, and the reason I asked this is because, you know, a lot of them, uh, like, make it sound like the first break is kind of just happened, but it doesn't always happen, right? So I'd, I'd love to understand what the circumstances were. Yeah, I wish it was that simple. You know, my mom was you know, a classical musician and um, she was just a piano teacher. So she was not involved in performing or anything in the industry. And and uh, for me, it was just kind of 15 years of hard work and hitting the wall and rejection and finally getting somebody to believe in me and uh, give me a shot. So uh, to this day, I think she's very surprised that I've been able to make a living at it because as a musician, you know, she understands how hard it is and how lucky you have to be. Um, I think my dad was a little more optimistic than she was. Yeah. But uh, yeah, so for me, it was it was little, literally just, you know, rock, making demos, playing gigs, trying to get my music out there. And, uh, you know, I am one of those, I've said it before, but I am one of those kind of 20 year overnight success stories where, you know, I worked 20,000 hours before I made a penny doing this. <laughs> Great. So, okay. So now, um, and now on to uh, kind of two songs that are very special uh, to me and and a whole bunch of my friends. One is Superman, and the other is Hundred Years. Uh, and I, I'd love to know the story the story behind both these songs, if possible. And the third, I, I think, I think the follow on question is, you know, you do a lot of singing, you do a lot of songwriting. Do you, uh, is there a, is there a process? Is, is it an inspiration will strike sort of process or is there a more method, methodical process? Would love to understand what the sort of creative process is. Okay. Well, uh, to your first question about those two, two particular songs, um, Superman was a gift. I, I wrote Superman from beginning to end in about an hour, uh, geez, almost 20 years ago now. And it was in the midst of writing many other songs and, you know, as a young songwriter, and I tell this to songwriters all the time, the key is to write a lot of songs. And I was, I was writing hundreds of songs <laughs> a year, <laughs> not many good ones, but Superman was just one of those songs. And, and when I first wrote it, uh, I didn't think it was for me. I kind of fancied myself more as a rock guy, Yeah. but, uh, but I always thought that that song was, was a special song. And when we recorded it for the America town record, you know, me and my producer, Greg, kept coming back to Superman whenever we'd work on it and go, you know, if anybody ever heard this song, they might appreciate the sentiment. A uh, hundred years was different because when I wrote Superman, I was a struggling kind of musician without a record deal, just trying to make, make it. hundred years was how do you follow your first hit and how, how do you not become a one hit wonder? And, and they're both very hard to do, you know, Superman yeah. to write a song that, that can kind of launch your career. I think it's almost harder sometimes to write that second song that is not just kind of a copy of your hit, but a song that kind of takes the next step. And, yeah. and to me, you know, 100 years took 
almost a year to, you know, to, to get right. Um, and once I wrote it, you know, once I had the concept, it took three months to get the lyrics. So, you know, Superman took 45 minutes, hundred years took three months. And, and, uh, but, but to this day, you know, hundred years was the crucial song because, you know, I was, I was a songwriter all of a sudden, not just the Superman guy. So hmm. that, that, that kind of, gives you a little background on those two songs and and just one one more interesting point is that people sometimes appreciate is is superman is not a song i could write today uh the sentiment of that song being what it is and it's not easy to be me you know definitely reflects more on a struggling singer songwriter than a yes kind of middle-aged middle-aged dad who's who's kind of realized his childhood dream 100 years is a song that i certainly relate to more because I kind of grow up with that song. And, and that's the nice thing about that song is as we get older, there's a verse for everybody. Yes, yeah. <laughs> and and I, yeah. I kind of grow with it. Um, and that kind of feeds into the, the songwriting process. You know, there's a lot of things that go into a song and uh, a creative work. Um, and as much as, you know, you can talk about talent and inspiration and, and all that stuff, I, I, I'm a true believer in work ethic and that if I'm not writing, if I'm not playing, nothing's happening, and that you may have to write a thousand songs to write 100 years, or write a thousand songs to get a Superman. And, and that said, you know, there are tools, you know, inspiration can come from, you know, painful places. Most of the good songs come from painful places and, and in introspection and, and integrity. And you can also, you know, find ideas through observations, you can kind of look at other people's lives or other people's circumstance. And, I, you know, I'm a believer that there's a great song everywhere if you could just see it. Uh, sometimes, for me, listening is a great tool. You know, I so many of my songs come from listening to what my kids say or what my friends say or what I may see mm. on TV or in the world. So I think the key is to always be on the lookout for a good idea. And and once you have that concept, kind of like hundred years, once I had the concept of of kind of living in the moment and a wish is never better than this, and I knew that the verses were going to be kind of vignettes in our lives, mm -hmm. the the rest is is now more talent and, and you know, spending, you know, three months writing 200 verses to get the four that you use. So <laughs> um, it certainly is a process and it's a very frustrating process because at the end of the day, what sounds very simple is, is very hard to create. And it's also a subjective process and that <laughs> yeah. sometimes the best songs you write are not hits and are not popular and they're, they're much better songwriters than me, you know, sitting at home frustrated that they'll never be able to kind of get their music out there. So it is certainly a, uh, you know, it is, it's kind of a wild occupation, but you know, for me, I'm very grateful that I've been able to do it this long and, and have been able to kind of share my music, you know, beyond just the hits with, uh, with a lot of folks. Yeah. So, so, so I, I know you know you do a fair bit of songwriting in the back, aside from your own songs. So again, when you talk about work ethic, do you like make sure you show up at an office every every morning? So, what what is your <laughs> what does the week in John's schedule sort of look like? Well, luckily my office is in my house, you know, 20 yards from my bedroom, so <laughs> I can I can go and you know when I was a kid, I would work. I mean, I would I would be recording, writing, singing, you know. 70, 80 hours a week, you know, and, and having to make a living in the meantime, every free second, I'd be kind of honing my craft. Um, I don't do it as much anymore because, again, I'm not a single, you know, 25-year-old chasing a dream. But I do, you know, when I make it a record, I will spend, you know, I'll put the kids to bed and I'll go to work, you know, and then when they're at school, I'll work during the day. And and the hours may not be nine to five, mm. but you know, you'll put in thousand, two thousand hours of songwriting to get the eleven, twelve songs people hear on the record. And then, you know, you'll put in another thousand hours in the recording process and, and mixing and, and then and then the whole promotion starts. <laughs> then yeah. selling the record. You know, it, it it's it's such a you know, it's 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 a it's a big kind of ordeal, not just make the, the making the record's the fun part. Yeah. And and you know, going out there and, and getting yourself to make another one, that's kind of what separates kind of people who have a career to folks who kind of come and go. Okay. So now, um, the, what are, what are, and you, you've seen probably many, many, many one hit wonders, right? 
Uh, what is yeah. the biggest difference between somebody who's able to sustain success for a long time uh, and somebody who comes and goes, as you said? You know, I think part of it is there's a lot of components to that. I think one is understanding that it's not all about you. Um, and I think sometimes, especially in the celebrity culture, you know, you'll you'll have a hit song or a hit movie yeah. or uh, and all of a sudden you'll be famous and rich and famous. And, and it's a very narcissistic place to be. Now, you need a certain element of narcissism just to do the job, to go on stage, <laughs> you know, and sing for a thousand people or go on TV and sing for six million people. Yeah. You have to have an ego, but you also have to realize that it's not all about you, and you have to re remember what got you there. I was very lucky that I had success, you know, relatively late. I was in my late twenties, yeah. So I understood how hard it was and how lucky I was, yeah. Um, but you know, I think I think you have to remain humble, and you also have to get a little lucky. You know, you have to, you know, have that next song that can like launch, you know, launch your career after a hit, and and you also have to fight the record companies because. A record company's tendency is once you have a hit is they want to regurgitate that song again. And I've seen so many band songwriters kind of be forced by the label to regurgitate that song that made them successful. And mm. if you do that too close, nobody wants to hear the same song anymore. Yes. So, so how do you, the, the challenge is how do you write something that can stand on its own that is uh, a great song, but still stays true to who you are and, and that's why I have so much respect for the iconic bands and iconic songwriters, whether it's U2 or Billy Joel or Elton John or the Beatles, or, you know, go down the list, the who, yeah. where, you know, continued to reinvent themselves, but still stay true to who they were and write great song after great song. It's really hard to do. And that's why you see, you know, so few, especially today in a kind of a, a faceless, you know, pop scene. Yeah. Um, it's you know music is so generic it's really hard to kind of you know continue and, and build yourself a real career hmm. okay so the, the next one is, is is more commercial right so uh, I we always hear it from the music companies as to the cost of piracy uh, and and you know I, I'm, I'm speaking from a Asia and this is a very pertinent issue like for example yeah I, 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 I buy my music on iTunes but it's so problematic just because you know, I need a U.S. address to get access to all of this. Like, they don't make it easy here, so piracy is is rampant. And I'd love to understand right. sort of what um, what your uh, sort of the artist view is. How does this hit you? How does this affect you? Uh, you know, where does most of your, does most of your money come from? From records bought online, or is it from concerts? Would be great to get a sense of it from your point of view. Well, to take your point, I think um, I think the record industry did a terrible job with the early downloading and early piracy, even here in the States with Napster mm -hmm. and getting, getting ahead of it and making it easy and cheap to download music. They just wanted to sue everybody. So yeah. basically what happened is you have a generation who grew up getting music for free yeah. because, um, because it was hard to do or, or, you know, they were made the enemy or for whatever reason, and it's similar to where you are. It should be easy to get music and cheap. Now, here in the States, it's easy. I yes. can go buy any song for 69 cents. Yes. And you know, that's easy for me to do. And if even if you're 12 years old, 15 years old, you can afford 69 cents. But now you have a culture of kind of, uh, you know, kind of free downloading that people expect music to be free. And, and for me personally, you know, it's not going to change my life. I mean, I frankly got lucky in that I caught, you know, Superman came out when people could still sell records Yes. and you could make money. And I caught the end of that. And so for me, it's not a huge financial burden. But what I what I'm concerned about is, you know, as you know, it, you know, making making music is not free. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> it costs music. It costs money to make a record, even in, with technology. It costs, you know, 50,000, 200,000, you know, dollars to, to make a record when you hire mixers and engineers and musicians and then you have to promote your record and and it's not free to hire a band it's not free to go on a tv show for people to hear you so it's not you know even though videos have come way down yeah you know make a video for 20 grand instead of 200 grand yeah. it's still not free and i'm concerned that it's becoming so hard to make a living at music unless you're a superstar yeah unless you're that that music will become more of a hobby and 
the real true singer songwriters that can be in part of the culture will kind of be factored out just because there's no income stream and there's no career. Um, so I, I am concerned about it. I think it's a big problem. Um, I don't know what the answers are. Um, and, and for me, very little of my income, I'd say less than 5% comes from record sales. Okay. Um, so it, a, I am concerned more, about it. John, I mean, I hear that it's, it's, it's becoming more concert sales than record sales, but you know, what, what, what is the, what is the general norm? Yeah, I mean, it depends. If you're a songwriter, then you you do very well on royalties. You know, you, you get radio royalties, and and now with the internet, you get sound exchange royalties. Um, if you're a good touring act, um, yeah, you can make money touring. Now, yeah. now you know a lot of kind of pop musicians don't write their own songs, so there's not that music stream hmm. or that income stream. And then. Think about it too. Even if you're a successful touring act, most of the, if you're a band, <laughs> you got to split that up, and you yeah. have a lot of expenses. So yeah, yeah, yeah. For for me, for me, yes. You know, it's virtually all my money comes from touring, uh, which I don't do as much anymore, and kind of royalties on my songs from either licensing or radio. Okay, got it. So uh, so so changing tracks now. Um, what you know. Uh, You've launched a video charity website. Uh, why is that? What was the inspiration? Well, you know, I think uh, when you're kind of fortunate enough to kind of live the dream and, and you see that your music can make a difference in people's lives and, and you feel very blessed um, financially and, and, and kind of your life, I think you look at yourself in the mirror and say, what can I do to give back? And and uh, I have seen, especially, you know, when Superman came out, so many different charities uh, started asking me to use that song for, for fundraising or uh, awareness. And I saw how music can really make a difference in people's lives, emotionally, financially, um, awareness, all those things. And so we started doing that with my songs, and I've been doing it ever since. And the website you mentioned, uh, What Kind of World Do You Want?, which is... <laughs> You know, it kind of ran its course, but it was a, a charity website to to raise money for charities close to my heart where people could kind of make their own videos and kind of capitalize on the YouTube phenomena of everybody's a filmmaker and mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. use different songs in a creative way to to raise money. Uh, that was kind of a fun, a fun way to raise money. And we did that. It was great. I mean, I've been fortunate to work with many different projects. You know, we did that for a while and raised some money. Then we did the CD for the Troops project, which which kind of gave free CDs to, to the soldiers yeah. and their families. And and so for me, it's, it's just great. I mean, you, you feel good when you, you, you know, giving is a selfish enterprise <laughs> because yeah. you feel so, yeah. so good um, when you, you can make a difference. So, yeah. I you know, I feel very fortunate that I've been able to do that. Great. So an another another uh, different question. I mean, one of the things you always associate with celebrities, like it or not, is sort of bad family lives, uh, and sort of <laughs> <laughs> and 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 I noticed. Uh, I mean, from from, re from you know reading about you on the internet, and and of course your fatherhood award, that obviously family sort of uh, takes a different place um, uh, at where you're concerned. How do you manage that with the, all the fame and the paparazzi and everything that goes with 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 who you are? <laughs> Well, yeah, you'll never find me on the cover of People magazine. <laughs> uh, you know, there's a few reasons for that. Number one is I, I'm not, you know, I'm very low on the totem pole of celebrities. You know, I've, I've had success, but the reality is most people know my songs. They don't know me. And, yes. uh, and, and, and that's fine. I, I'm fine with that. And as nice as it is to be recognized, and it's cool, and it's nice to, you know, have people kind of know who you are and that kind of thing, you know, to kind of want your autograph and stuff. Um, I think, you know, being being older when I had success, being very kind of grounded by my parents and having a wife that holds me accountable, <laughs> you know, and, 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 you know, having kids too, you know, when you have kids, it doesn't matter if you have a hit or you don't because they look at you the same and, and you, you're really able to have a certain balance. And, and I'm not going to lie to you, I'm a very comp competitive guy and I like to win and I like to have success and I like to have all those things that go along with success in the music business but i also think they give me a certain perspective where at the end of the day i kind of know what really matters and 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 you know a lot of that stuff that you talk about all the 
drama that goes on with celebrities. You know, those are very unhappy people. And, and I've seen in my life people who rise to great success, not just in music, but in different occupations. But in their private lives, they're kind of miserable because they don't have that kind of balance and priority. So luckily for me, I have a great family and uh, it's uh, all that other stuff, you know. I'll leave it to the other folks. <laughs> Great. So we're, we're getting to the end. I'll probably take a couple more minutes, John. So, so, uh, so just just a couple of questions left. One is, you know, any favorite sort of TV shows, movies, books that you generally watch, just off the top of your head, or or you like, or you've liked of of all time? Well, you know, I'm gonna be very cliche, but of course, you know, with the end of Breaking Bad, you know, we all love Breaking Bad, and. Maybe that's bad that we love Breaking Bad, but we love Breaking Bad. And, and I, you know, I, I, I enjoy those kind of shows and I love The Wire. And, and I'm a sci-fi guy because of my dad. You know, I'm a kind of old school Asimov, Heinlein, uh, Frank Herbert, sci-fi. I'm a big reader. I, I love to read and I love to read, you know, Murakami. I love him, you know, uh, uh, Margaret Atwood. You know, I, I, I'm, you know, I, I do love reading and I, I draw inspiration from books. Mm -hmm. So, you know, those are a couple I'll throw at you and there, you know, there's a lot more that comes from there. I'm sure. So, uh, I guess the second last question, but what are, you know, I, I, even if uh, your uh, office is 20 yards away or uh, whatever, 20 meters away from your bed, you still, you, you probably need to do a lot to stay productive because I'm sure you've got requests to do this and that on the way and, and hundreds of things going on in a day. What are some of, you know, are there any productivity hacks you use? Are there, you know, are there any little uh, sort of habits or routines during a day that help you stay productive and focused on songwriting? You know, talking about Murakami, who's one of my favorite authors, he wrote a book um, uh, called What I Talk About When I Talk About Running. And he talked about in that book how every day he will go for a workout. He'll go run an hour or two. Mm -hmm. And and it, it stimulates his creativity and kind of keeps him sane. And, and I agree with that. I, I write my best lyrics when I'm not staring at the page. You know, I'll put my work tape, you know, or my, my headphones on and I'll go for a hike a two hour hike and I'll write lyrics. And I, I find that kind of staying active and, and, you know, staying healthy and, and working out and, and doing all that physical stuff, those endorphins stimulate the creativity too. So it's a balance. Yeah. You got to do the work. You got to sit at the piano. You got to sit the computer. You got to, you know, write thousands of verses. But I find that kind of the physical activity really also helps kind of stimulate the creative and, and they pay dividends both ways. Perfect. Final question. Uh, what is an idea that inspires you that you would like to share? Hmm. What is an idea that inspires me? Well, even at my cynical old age, <laughs> um, I, I do love kind of the idea of starting from nothing and creating something. And it doesn't have to be just a song. It can be a poem. It can be a book. It can be uh, a business, um, entrepreneurship. Uh, I love that spirit of starting with a blank slate and then ending up with something. And it doesn't even have to be great because I truly believe, you know, the joy is in the journey and the results may be exciting. The results may be disappointing. But when, when I look back on my career and, and whether it's a high note or a low note commercially, you know, the path to get there was really what I look back on fondly. And, uh, Maybe that's the inspiration that I can leave with you with. That is fantastic. John, I, I th thank you so much uh, for taking the time. Uh, it, it was just wonderful speaking. 